A lot of people talk about just having an eye for lighting, but I just felt like I had to learn the technical to achieve the non-technical. That's what's gonna separate you from pretty much everybody right now. What's up, Andy Mogul? Ted here, and welcome back. And to kick things off today, here is a question. What do you actually need to make films? Nothing. Scene and video, thank you, and good night. The truth is, you don't really need great gear to make great films. And if you're gonna hear it from anybody, please hear it from me. I work in the industry of making gear. And I know a bunch of you guys are like, hey, Ted. You guys have been using a lot of gear. To which I say, yeah, we have and we use gear. The only thing that changes when you have gear is you realize that it doesn't help you as much as you thought it would in the first place. So, no bro, you don't need that gimbal. But if you are ready to spend a little bit of coin on your filmmaking journey, if you are ready to invest in yourself and you're ready to start building skills with gear, what do you actually need to buy? And how do you make sure you're not wasting money on trends? To find out, I reached out to my friend Caleb Pike, who's the force of nature known as DSLR Video Shooter. He's basically the OG channel when it comes to filmmaking gear. He's been studying it for over a decade and he's been making videos about it for like nine years. And when it comes to gear, especially for digital creators, there's basically nobody there that's been posting about it as long as he has. So we left Toronto and we said goodbye to our friend Maddie, and we headed out straight to Chai Town to go visit my buddy Caleb Pike. But first, what is going on guys? We are still in Toronto. Basically we're gonna be heading over to Chicago. It leaves at 7.14. Okay, what time is it now? It's now 10 to 7. Yes, it has happened. We missed a flight. <laughs> so we're gonna be flying out tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. Let's do it. So. From the person that has seen it all, the ups, the downs, the trends that have come around and stuck around, what do you really need? Now, this is just a small portion of our discussion with Caleb Pike, but make sure you check out the full discussion in the podcast link down below. So basically, as someone that's seen like a lot of gear, what are the top things to kind of cut through the fluff that people really, if they're starting out, should actually invest in? I actually went years and years and years and years without getting a nice tripod. And even this, to this day, I hate to say it, I don't have a super nice tripod. So I would recommend getting a, a decent set of sticks. If you have to start cheap, that's fine. Uh, Benro is a company I've used a lot. Their S8, if you can afford it, is a great kind of middle of the road, solid tripod. What are you looking for in a good tripod? Something that can balance nicely, something that on the pan and the tilt, you can just move it and there's no weird jitters. I really like to have one with a bowl of some kind. That's why I love Benro. The center column goes up and down and there's a bowl. Oh, boring. A gimbal can do everything that a slider and a jig and a tripod can do, no it can't. If you were just starting out, you really don't need one. In fact, I guarantee that you'll end up getting much more use out of a tripod than a gimbal. You're gonna learn how to shoot locked off shots with lighting like this one. And in many ways, I actually think that having a gimbal can make you a worse off filmmaker. With the gimbals and stuff, you know, people uh, just kind of throw the camera all over the place. There's no motivated movement. So a tripod, I feel like people think more about, um, you know, their framing, their composition. From there, I really love vintage lenses. So you can save a ton of coin. Hold the phone, you're telling me that I need lenses? Like plural? Aren't those expensive? And yes, they are. And while cameras have dropped in price because of the DSLR boom, lighting is dropping in price because of LEDs. Thank you, LEDs. Honestly, out of everything in the filmmaking industry, I think lenses are like the one thing that haven't dropped in price yet. They haven't had a dramatic spike yet. But in the meanwhile, before they drop in prices, which I think they will eventually, what are our options? Go back and buy like Carl Zeiss Jenna lenses or FD lenses. I have, you know, some right here. I love them. They're really affordable. Probably the cheapest, best looking lenses out there. You know, a whole set for, I don't know, $500, $1,000, depending on how nice uh, and fast of a set you go for. I love this tip. Vintage lenses are super overlooked. They have a different quality to them, a different look to them. But if you are just starting off and you're trying to understand what the difference is between different focal lengths, there's nothing that beats having a full kit of vintage primes for super cheap and actually try swapping out lenses and understanding what it does to your image. 
So aside from cost, which is significant, uh, older lenses are gonna have older coatings. These days we can coat lenses to do anything, to have zero flares, lots of contrast. These older lenses, uh, they're going to have a lower contrast. Flaring is amazing as well. And then the, the characteristics of the bokeh is really interesting. All right, so for number three, what are we recommending here? We're looking at a color chart. And in particular, this is a little color checker passport from x -Rite. What I love about it is the size, first and foremost, and it's really rugged. It's got a nice hard case. It's like a tiny Pelican case. This just lives in my back pocket on set or near my camera setup when I'm in the studio. There's a good chance that you've never seen this before. And if that's the case, there's also a good chance that you or someone you know has been the victim of shooting color or footage that just doesn't look right. We've all been there, it's daylight, and you shot it at 2000 Kelvin. <laughs> you can't just drag a slider over because the way these cameras are reading all that information, you need to make sure red is red, green is green, white, middle gray, and black are all brought back to that correct uh, color. And if you ever had that shot where you just can't get the skin right, this will save your bacon. With something like an x ray color checker, all you've got to do is slip one of these into your shot. Generally speaking, every time you start shooting in a new location or change your lighting setups, because that's when your colors are going to change. And then in post, all you have to do is use your software to actually identify that color checker, correct those colors so that you can actually have perfect color and skin tones in every single shot. This is great. This is dummy proof. It's something early on that will help and save your footage. What I think is the most important thing that'll separate you from most people today and that's lighting. Mm -hmm. One bright light, doesn't matter what it is, something bright, and we're going to modify that. For a bright light. Now forget the camera, everyone has a camera, but very few people have good lighting. I use a 120D Mark II, if you just want it to be cheap, buy a old Mole Richardson 1K for like 50 bucks, Horrible. Yeah, it'll last you forever. And just in case you're wondering, yes, you will be able to do everything that the big fancy doohickey lights can do, with a Mole Richardson 1K. It'll be a little bit more tricky because it's hot, but since it's 1K and it only pulls about a thousand watts, that means that you can still plug it into a normal household circuit. You want something with a big fat chip on it. A big fat source. So why is having one source so important? Well, one source means one shadow, which is good because it looks a little bit more natural. After all, the sun is one source. So anytime you see a multi-source light, i.e. light panels, be careful because you're going to need to diffuse that light. You're either gonna to need to bounce it off of a wall or shoot it through some kind of diffusion that changes that multi-source light into a single source light from that one diffusion panel. Otherwise, you're gonna get something known as the multi-shadow effect, which looks bad. So look, if you take anything away from this video, remember this. Panel lighting should always be used as diffusion and that good lighting with a boring camera will always look better than a good camera with boring lighting. So you've got your big light source, doesn't matter what it is, it's big, it's bright. Then usually I'm going with something like this. This is a Kane TV F30 or F55. Number five, an accent light. Now I know that we just talked about our big source and the one that you need. Yes, I'm sorry, you need a second light. Now we're talking about the opposite end of the spectrum. We're talking about getting a tiny little kicker light. Uh, very simple to operate. This one's a bicolor model. It's got little barn doors on it. So if you just want just that little kiss of light right there on your hair, this is gonna do that for you. Whereas when the big fat source is used for softening and for acting as your key, this tiny little kicker light is actually perfect for adding a hair light, which you'll usually end up placing on the opposite side of your key light to end up bringing out your subject from their background, all that darkness back there. Or you can actually use these little lights as an accent light, which is basically a light that is used for adding little kisses of light for things that you wanna see. Like, hey, ooh, look at that little accent light. There's one right there. So we just talked about our big light source. We talked about our small light source. What are we talking about now? C stands. And you need them and you need lots of them. So uh, at least get one and just start using it, experimenting with it. You can do anything with a C stand. Number six, a C stand. Now they're heavy, I know, they're expensive, I know, but it will save you so many hours in the future if you start learning how to grip it now. And there are so many other ways to rig a light than just on. With the C-Stand, you're gonna be able to start playing around with things like complicated lighting, underslinging lights, arming them out, and they're useful for more than just lighting too. We're holding up sound blankets right now. We have a light on a C-Stand. We even have a camera because we needed a second tripod essentially, clamping and rigged up which is another reason you need a C-stand. So you can post things online and post your rigs. 
Number seven, shotgun microphone. For that, I use a Deity SO2 microphone. Love it, it's a Thank beast. You. It feels good with this device. Solid brass, strong. I have worked a ton with the uh, Sennheiser MK416, which it just sounds and feels like the same. So that's kind of like the last mic for me. Now, I'm not an audio professional, but I do know that when you're looking for a good shotgun, there's a lot of contradictory advice out there. And it used to confuse me a lot too, so hopefully I can share some knowledge of what I've learned. People will tell you to look for a microphone that has a lot of bass in the sound, so it sounds warmer. And there's also people that will tell you to look for a mic that sounds neutral. And they both can't be right, right? Bass or neutral, which one do you choose? If you're going straight out the gate, a microphone with added bass is going to sound better. It's gonna sound fuller because it is pre-EQ'd to boost the bass on the microphone. Now, neutral audio can always be EQ'd to introduce more bass, and there will not be any noise or distortion from doing so, which is why neutral audio is what most professionals look for. It's actually gonna play much better in post, so if you're recording things like voices or sound effects, really anything where you're planning on doing a sound mix, neutral audio is where you want to go. That said, it does require a little bit more work if you want that normal bass sound. So if you're new and you're straight out the gate and you want that bass immediately, that's actually totally up to you. However, now you actually know what the difference is between added bass and neutral audio and why there's so much damn confusion about it online. And on top of that, I really dig the SMX15, I believe it is, from Asden. It's a really nice kind of alternative to the road stuff. Number eight, audio recorder. Now that you've got your big old fancy microphone, the next thing that you need is a recorder to actually plug it into. This is what I've ended up with, and it's probably gonna be like, for a video guy, the, like the last thing I'll need to buy. And that's the Mix Pre 3 from uh, Sound Devices. So this is an audio preamp and recorder, really clean. You can leave it if it's too low, you can boost it up, There's, it's super clean. It has analog limiters, which essentially means if you do have that nasty distortion over zero problem, this will catch it before it's written. Love this guy. And it's really affordable for sound devices at around 600, 650. Now the benefit of something like the Mix Pre 3 is that it allows you to adjust the recording with these knobs right here. Now the idea is that you generally want to avoid anything that has buttons or anything that doesn't give you smooth control of those levels. After that, it's really about how many inputs you have on your recorder, what the battery life is like, and how reliable it is overall. Is that it? Are those other things? Are those other things? Is that camera. Else? Camera. <laughs> I love that we forgot about the camera. And finally, we have come full circle and arrived to the thing that I think a lot of you guys are waiting for, the camera. Guys, I can't say this enough, but just don't stress out too much about the camera. Yes, it's important, I'm not denying that. Yes, it's cool, it's fun, it's exciting, but the reason it's last is because this is the part of your kit that's going to depreciate faster than anything else. This is also the part of your kit that's going to become outdated before you know it. Cameras come out every three, four months these days. My thing is always buy a camera that you can own, not go into debt for, hopefully, uh, and that'll cover maybe 80 to 90% of your work. And then for those huge gigs, rent. But since I know a lot of you guys are curious about it, and to be totally honest, I am too, here is Caleb's camera choice for 2019. I would consider something like a GH5. It's 4K. Uh, has really solid, when you're talking about logs, I love the log. Um, just an all around solid camera. These days it's kind of like large full frame sensor, good autofocus, good shallow depth of field, and then smaller sensors, but high pixel quality. There's just so much information there. It records up to 400 megabits a second, that's 422 10-bit. So there's just, all that is to say, tons of information that you can start to move around. On a lot of these other cameras, you know, they're cutting corners to save on what, you know, heat really, that's the biggest problem. So you're gonna start to see stuff fall apart pretty quick. So there you go guys, you don't need a whole lot of film gear to start filmmaking, but if you wanna start investing or spending in gear, here are the first nine things that you wanna buy. So I would prefer you spend the money on lenses, tripod lighting, modifiers, C-stands, and then get cameras like this that you can rotate and yes, I know that there are a couple things that are not on this list, like say a drone or a gimbal, but that's because to both, at least me and Caleb, look, they just aren't that important. All that other stuff we talked about is gonna stick with you. I'm gonna have that mix pre until, you know, I'm gone or it's gets run over by 50 trucks because it's that strong. sound devices and you get it repaired. Exactly. Customer service is pretty good. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So cameras, you know, I don't wanna hang on to this for 
10 years. But anyway, I know that there's a lot of tools out there that we didn't actually get to. So if you think of anything, feel free to let us know in the comments below of what else you think should be recommended. I'll also put Caleb's full link in the description below as well as here on the screen. And hopefully it showed up. Make sure you check out the full podcast link below where we talk about gear and how Caleb got into filmmaking. Do you feel like film school was something that you still wouldn't go to? Or? No. No, I'm so glad I did it. Mainly because of financing. Make sure to tune in next week when we go to go visit Devin Supertramp to learn how to make stunts look even better than they do in real life. One of the first things I say is study Michael Bay, the filmmaker. No way! <laughs> that is it for me. I'm Ted from Indie Mogul. And of course, we'll catch you guys in the next one. Oh. 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 There she blows. Mm -mm -mm.